and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for the next hour of answering your gardening questions. If you'd like to get in touch with us, just dial 1-800-676-5446. Those phone volunteers will be really glad to help you. You can also submit pictures and questions for a future show. Email us at byf at unl.edu. Do tell us where you live. Please let us know what's going on in your garden. After tonight's show, you should be able to check out Backyard Farmer YouTube channel for all of those past features and programs. You can also follow us during the week on our Facebook page. So, Kyle, you have two pieces of creature there. What do you, what do you have tonight? Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about um, aphids on trees tonight. So, um, it's that time of year where I get a lot of questions. People are seeing aphids on their trees and are really concerned and, you know, not sure what to do. So, um, the first sample I, I brought in here is an oak leaf. And um, what you might notice is that there's actually no aphids on this, this leaf anymore. So you can still see it's kind of shiny and, and sticky there from, from honeydew. Um, so just a couple weeks ago, these, this oak tree had a bunch of aphids. But um, what showed up were these ladybugs and they basically just wiped out all of these aphids here. So um, nothing left. I couldn't find a single aphid on, on this tree this week. So I guess kind of my, the moral of this story is that, you know, with, with trees and aphids, um, one of the best management options that we have is doing absolutely nothing and letting Mother Nature um, just kind of do its own thing and, uh, and uh, run its course. So um, a single uh, ladybug here, this, this larva, she can eat um, up to 5,000 aphids in, in her lifetime. So they really do a remarkable job controlling aphids. And um, here's a, an example of, of the pupa for that. So we have the, the larva and pupa here of, of this ladybug. So um, ladybugs though, as great as they are, they don't always, you know, they don't always get rid of everything. So um, in the case of these woolly bark aphids here on, on this maple, um, they're kind of notorious for, uh, for having really large populations that um, aren't as well controlled by those natural enemies. So in cases like this, um, we can really just control these pretty simply by uh, spraying them off with, with a pretty strong uh, stream of water. Um, if that's still, you know, there's still some lingering, um, insecticidal soaps work really, really well on these aphids. Um, and otherwise, they're really not too damaging. Um, they mostly feed on, on mature trees, so, you know, um, not a big concern. Uh, it's mostly a cosmetic thing. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, Rock, what do we have here? Uh, this is a common weed. I think a lot of people know what it is. It's a Portulaca oleracea, for those of you that like Latin names, um, but it's common purslane. The interesting thing about common purslane is that it has a very unique photosynthetic pathway. It has the same pathway that cactus does, which makes it very difficult to control because normally stomates are open during the day and herbicides can enter through those points as well as others, but in this one, they're closed during the day. So it doesn't make herbicide activity very well, very good on it, but there are herbicides that can control it. It is also an ornamental, so sometimes it escapes from the garden and and that sort of thing and it is also edible and makes a great addition to a salad so if you have it and you haven't sprayed it certainly you can break it up it's got a little bit of a salty taste to it um, and a little bit of a bite but not not bitter but the thing I wanted to talk about today is that Chris Proctor one of our uh, uh, graduate students that went on to be one of our faculty members talked about how they can vegetatively reproduce so if you look over here you have a piece of stem that has, uh, you know, there's no nodes on, well, this one has a node right there. And this would propagate at about 80% if that fell to the ground. If you had segments like that, 80% of the time it would germinate. This one doesn't have the node, so it won't germinate. But if it has leaves, that jumps up to 90%. So if we put, you know, 10 of these in a pot and just irrigated it once, nine out of 10 of those would germinate. Oh my goodness. So when you get out your hoe and get take out your aggressions on, um, Purslane, you're only helping it propagate, right? It starts to get shattered all over the place. So let, let's not do that. If you pull it up from the taproot, get it all and make sure you pick it all up. You can throw it in the compost pile. It's very high in moisture, so it adds a little bit to that, a um, little bit of uh, nitrogen as well to the compost pile. But it, you've got to be very careful going to use it because three out of four dentists surveyed recommend that you don't put chop it up when you, <laughs> when you weed it. So there you go. Does that change once it dries out? Like if it's in the sun and it dries out rock, or does it still? That's a great question, and, and we did a little side study, and basically it can desiccate down to almost like a dried leaf, mm -hmm. and it'll still propagate. Wow. Yep. Wow. Amazing. 
Speaking of leaves and edible things. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> share a, a little culture tonight and a little background. <laughs> Uh, a lot of our viewers know I'm a child of the South, and uh, I grew up eating something a lot of people here control, which is pokeweed. And uh, I was out last night collecting some pokeweed for my still continuous Southern diet. And uh, I just ran across something I thought I would share with everyone. So if you can see this kind of yellow and green modeling. So we talk a lot about viruses uh, on the show and, and the need to rogue those plants out that have viruses. The majority of the pokeweed population out there has pokeweed mosaic virus, hmm. uh, which is very common. And uh, it's one that is most likely seed transmitted through the population because a lot of that group of viruses are seed transmitted at a high rate. So um, just another example of uh, plants that maybe we don't want in the yard, but they get sick also. And uh, when we see that, if we see that in our cultivated or cultivars that we're trying to, to grow and we see that mosaic pattern, if it's not a cultivar that has that breaking pattern in the leaf tissue, that's a time to rogue that plant out, so. All right, and oh. you're not, can you still eat that one? Oh yeah, yeah, it's, I, I haven't done a comparison of the nutritional value of pokeweed infested <laughs> pokeweed salad and non, but we should do that. All right. <laughs> okay. Must be edible night, except for Kyle on the end here. So what do you have, Terry? So yes. So I think mine is probably going to be the most edible of them all. Um, mostly, <laughs> most of all, most all of you um, hear me tell about all the new All America selection plants that come into the garden. I was going to start that last week, but I had to fill in tonight. So I thought I would start this week on the show for my sample. So this is um, an oak leaf lettuce called Bauer. It's brand new to All America Selection this year for 2022. Um, you can eat it small, clip it. You can pull it as a head. It's very nice, crisp. It has not started to bolt yet. We've had this in the garden for a little bit. And even with all these hot temperatures, it hasn't started to bolt any. Um, and we, the judges that say this, if you are working and doing any kind of hydroponics, this is one that would actually work very well in a hydroponic system. So if you're looking at trying some new lettuces, try this, it's called Bauer. Excellent, it's also kind of pretty. All right, Kyle, you get the first picture question round. Uh, your first one comes to us from Omaha, Boys Town area. What kind of caterpillar is this and is it a good guy or a bad guy? It's, uh, it's a white line sphinx caterpillar. So um, this is the, the larva for um, a, a sphinx or hummingbird moth. And um, they can have some outbreaks where, where we get large numbers of them and they can be damaging, but it's really, that happens more commonly in the South, um, not really a, a, a problem here. So it's not anything I'd be too concerned about unless you're seeing a bunch of them. So I just let it go. And, and the moths actually are really cool. They they uh, visit flowers at, at dusk, and a lot of people will mistake them for actually uh, for a hummingbird. So they're kind of nice to have around. <clears throat> cool. All right. You have three pictures of this next one. And uh, this, this viewer has had damage, like she can't believe she's had damage to the stem, she's had damage to the sides. Whatever it is doesn't eat it, but I think we have, do have one picture that shows a teeny little round curled up culprit there. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. Um, and a couple of pictures for sure looks like, like this last one and the first one, like cutworm uh, damage here. So um, they have, um, there's uh, several different species and some of them have pretty broad host range um, and will feed on a lot of different uh, vegetable crops, uh, flowers even. So um, controlling them can be difficult, um, especially at this, at this time, once they're large enough that they start cutting the plants, um, they're less susceptible. Um, <clears throat> you know, if, if it's a relatively small planting, um, a good thing you can do is just kind of go out and look for them. So they're active at night, they're nocturnal, and then they'll hide in the ground during the day. So if you go out and sort of scout for them in the evening, um, early night, you might be able to identify those and just hand remove them. 
Um, otherwise, you know, tilling that, that garden area in the spring can help remove anything that's overwintering there. Um, remove those weeds that might be a uh, host for them early on before you're planting your garden. Um, and then you can put some barriers for like vegetables and stuff, um, put barriers around those when you're transplanting them, um, like a can or something that uh, goes down a few inches, extends above the soil a few inches, and that can help exclude those cutworms from getting to those plants. All right, thanks Kyle. Uh, Rock, this uh, first round of pictures comes to you from Alliance. We have, um, three different pictures of a grass that they would like to have identified. Uh, so some pretty nice pictures here. They do say it's in an outlying area of their acreage. Okay, so the sec this picture that's on the screen right now, it has clasping oracles, which is that structure where the leaf hits the stem. And you can see where the, the, these, the, the structure called an oracle is wrapped around the stem. Uh, so that's a dead giveaway for several species. It's either a wheat grass, quack grass or perennial ryegrass. Um, it, it, can we back up? Sorry, I should have mentioned one more thing. It looks like it has rhizomes. I believe that second picture showed a rhizome down in the bottom. So then that isolates it pretty much to quack grass, especially when it's big, you know, about half the diameter of your finger. You don't have big rhizomes on uh, the, the wheat grasses. So, and I don't think it's perennial ryegrass because perennial ryegrass doesn't have rhizomes. So at the end of the day, with based on the seed head, the clasping oracle, I'm gonna say this is quack grass. It's a very aggressive perennial, cool season grass, and it's going to take multiple years and multiple applications of uh, some kind of graminicide or glyphosate to, uh, to, to eradicate it. And they didn't say where it, what it was in, right? Uh, they just said outlying area of the acreage. So yeah, it, it's gonna be one of those roundup applications, unfortunately. All right, or just mow it and go. Well, I'll mow it and let it blend in with everything else. But it, is, it, is, it does grow so much faster than everything else, Kim, that right. it's looking really rank when everything else around it is not. But if they, if they don't mow frequently, um, you know, mowing's not gonna eradicate it, but at the end of the day, at least it's going to uh, keep it tidy. All right, you have two pictures on this next one, Rock. This is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, they're saying for the first time they've ever had wild strawberries in their lawn, where'd they come from? How can they get rid of them without harming the turf? So. Okay, this is wild strawberry. They already identified it for us. And mm -hmm. it, it, they, it prolific amounts of seed, right? So mm -hmm. it can reseed itself and it can move into a lawn or it does have runners on it, which can move into the lawn from wherever it established. It tends to not like full sun. It likes that more that woodland type habitat um, at the end of the day. So, um, you know, in the sun, that's not gonna be a problem. There are, you know, triclopyr based <coughs> products. Um, you know, 2,4-D <coughs> doesn't do a great job on wild strawberry, but you know, those combination products that are designed for broadleaf um, herbicides, as long as they contain triclopyr or phylloxypyr, will do a pretty good job on a wild strawberry. And they are, by the way, edible. You don't want to spray them and then eat them, obviously, but they're a little tartar, and if you add that them to a, a cultivated strawberry, adds a little kick to your strawberry jam. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we must be hungry tonight. Everybody's talking about eating. before I got here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lauren, your first two are uh, fun. We haven't had this one yet this year. Yesterday, which was, he, he sent this June 11th, mm. yard was clear. Now today came home with these gray patches in the yard. What is it? It's powdery and almost black and what to do? That would be a slime mold and uh, they're just beautiful. They're all different colors. Many times in the lawn we see them gray or white. <clears throat> Mulch beds, sometimes you'll see them a bright yellow or orange color. <clears throat> uh, with these, you can really just take water and simply wash it away. It's not going to kill the turf. Uh, it will oftentimes reoccur in the same location in future years, uh, but just enjoy it. They're like M&M's. They yeah. come in all kinds of colors. All colors. <laughs> Very nice. Love You're, them. And you have three pictures for this next one. This is a broken bow viewer. Um, yard has taken a turn for the worse. Started looking rough after mowing uh, June 4th. No sign of insects, no drought, good fertility. Leaves are dying from the top down. They're mottled and striped, and this is bluegrass with some fescue, what do you think? Yeah, so I think there's one more picture and if we can stay on this picture, it, it is difficult to identify with fine leaf turfs like you know a bluegrass or I think they may have said they had some fine leaf fescue in mm -hmm. this blend too. Um, but they are dying from the tips back and it changed very quickly so that would suggest Ascochyta leaf blight mm -hmm. uh, which many times will occur in drier conditions or if we get a significant change in weather. Uh, in that particular case, wouldn't really recommend uh, any direct management 
right now outside of trying to maintain just adequate moisture, which it sounded like they were doing everything right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's difficult to say do more of that. Um, the one thing in one of the pictures, it did look like there was possibly some heavy thatch, which can also favor this. So that would be the only thing that I would suggest at another time to think about thatch management if that is an issue from the picture. All right, thanks, Lauren. Terry, um, unfortunately, your first round is how do we how do we handle the hail? And our uh, sympathy goes out to everybody in the state who keeps getting hammered. First one does come to us from Omaha. Um, and I think you have pictures in this one of shrubs in particular for the first two here. And then your second three come to us from um, Genoa and it's the garden itself. So containers, shrubs, whatever. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of us have been hit across the state with um, multiple nights of hail. So um, just to really start, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is to clean up as best you can um, any, if you have shrubs or herbaceous to get rid of most of that broken stuff, go and prune some of that stuff off, but try to leave, especially the herbaceous plants, perennial plants, leave as much of that green as you possibly can. Um, that's what's gonna photosynthesize and that's what's gonna keep that plant going. So um, some of those vegetables that you see just little sticks, that's gonna be kind of a harder one to do, but um, yeah, clean it up as best you can. Get rid of all of the dead material so Lauren won't have any diseases floating around. And um, don't fertilize. Keep it watered in case um, we do get dry. Um, just try to baby that plant as long as much as you possibly can. All right, thanks, Terry. <clears throat> well, all of us have been bothered during our picnics or our walks in the park by skeeters. Not only do they pester us during our outdoor activities, they can also carry some serious diseases. For our first feature tonight, Jody will give us some tips for keeping those mosquitoes off. Finally, summertime, and that's a time for grilling out with friends, working in the garden, harvesting some of our food crops, and it's also a time for mosquitoes. So let's talk about what we can do to protect ourselves from mosquito bites this summer. Mosquitoes are semi-aquatic, which means they spend most of their life cycle in aquatic environments. The female mosquito lays her eggs near or on the surface of the water where her larvae and pupae will develop. As adults, she is very mobile and she feeds not only on blood, but males and female mosquitoes will feed on nectar from flowering plants in the garden. We want to protect ourselves from mosquito bites because mosquitoes can transmit viruses such as West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis. We can protect ourselves by one, reducing the population of mosquitoes in our landscape and nearby areas, and two, by preventing them from biting us by wearing repellents. One of the things we can do is dump standing water. Mosquitoes can breed in the smallest amount of water, which includes a planter, a tree hole, a bird bath, or some tires left in the yard. When the water is left stagnant, mosquitoes can complete their life cycle in as little as seven to 10 days. Adult mosquitoes, on the other hand, can fly in from up to two miles away. So even if they're not breeding in your yard, they can fly in from neighboring yards and from the vegetation that they rest in during the day. Besides dumping standing water, you can also treat the water that you can't be dumped with mosquito dunks or Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. This is a bacterial product that the larvae of mosquitoes eat that will wipe them out, but it is non-toxic to wildlife, birds, fish, and humans. Another thing you can do is avoid going outside during times that mosquitoes are most active in your area, like dawn and dusk. You can wear loose-fitting clothing, a light color, so mosquitoes can land on you but not bite. But again, that mosquito repellent that's EPA approved is recommended so mosquitoes won't land on you. Make sure to fix 
your screens to your house, keep your doors closed when not in use so mosquitoes aren't flying into your home. You can also run a fan when you're sitting outside on a porch so mosquitoes have a hard time landing and will go away. One of the things you can do is share this information with your neighbors and your homeowners association because mosquito populations is a community-wide problem and the more people dumping standing water and reducing their populations in their own yard will make the whole neighborhood a mosquito-free place. We have had those big storms roll in lately, and that does mean it's a good idea to drain all those places in your yard that standing water stands and mosquitoes breed. So get out there and drain, and all those uh, leaves and all that stuff that's in my backyard, it's like, <laughs> here they come, just like Jody showed. <laughs> oh, well. All right, Kyle, you have um, a series here that is, they think they've identified it, and they're probably right. This is rural western Oto County. They think it's a lace wing, hundreds on their cup plants. Good, bad, cool. Yeah, they're right. It's a green lace wing um, and it's good. So um, like those ladybugs that I had earlier, these are notorious predators of, of aphids. Um, in fact, the, the immatures of larvae are called aphid lions. So um, they're good guys to have around too. Perfect, all right. Your second one is from the same uh, loyal viewer and they think it's a dotted checker spot caterpillar. Yeah, they're on the right track. It's, it's a checker spot. Um, I think this is Gorgon's, uh, Gorgon checker spot. Um, so yeah, they, they feed on um, sunflower, coneflowers, those sorts of things. All right, uh, third one here is, um, she cut down a crab apple, or had an old crab apple stump and found hundreds of these maggot worms. And what are they? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, <clears throat> they're, so there are maggots, they're fly larvae. Um, flies are really hard, you know, the maggots are really hard to identify and you don't see a lot of detail in the picture. So I'm not sure, but um, I might speculate they could be like black soldier flies or something like that. So, um, you know, the maggots will basically feed on anything decaying, um, animal waste, um, dead carcasses, plant, uh, decaying plant material, you name it. So that might be my guess, you know, they're in, if they're in like an old stump or something that's rotting or decaying that they're, they're feeding in there. And um, that's also kind of characteristic, that kind of sludgy material for, uh, um, for black soldier flies. So that would be my best guess of, of what this is. All right, and your final one here comes to us from Osmond, Nebraska. They wonder, is this a 10-lined June beetle grub and will they infest the lawn? They were in a tree when they took it down. Yep, so if it's in a tree, it's definitely not a 10-lined June beetle. Um, those live in the soil, they feed on the grass roots. Um, from a tree, it's probably Osmoderma, um, which is another scarab beetle. They feed on, on rotting, rotting logs, rotting wood, so um, not a problem, it won't hurt your lawn. All right, excellent. All right, turf, you've got three pictures on this first one rock. This is a papillion viewer. Um, and we have gotten many of these. Uh, according to the internet, looking at this, they think it's poison hemlock. If it is, how to get rid of it. So we have one, two, three on this four, and you can just barely see the purple spots. Yeah, the first two are pretty much a dead giveaway, the flower type, as well as the smooth stem with the purple blotches. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is poison hemlock, no doubt. Obviously, the viewer m must know a little bit about them, but it is a very toxic, um, every part has toxins in it, and um, actually, it's got hollow stems, and in the old days, kids would make pea shooters out of the hollow stems and get deathly ill from using it as a pea shooter, so that's how toxic it can be. Just a youth with a, with a piece of the stem in their mouth can pick it up. It's very toxic to livestock as well. Okay, how do you control it? It, it can be mowed, but you're gonna have to do it for three to five years and keep it mowed down and don't let it flower because it's a prolific seed producer, as you can tell by those white umbral flowers that are up there. If you wanna combine that with a herbicide, 2,4-D and dicamba in the spring when it first starts to leaf out, as long as the night times are not freezing. So as soon as you can do that, you might use that in combination, but you're still gonna be looking at something that you're gonna have to be persistent and it's gonna take a minimum, even with the combination of three years. And then you're gonna have to keep your eye on the air Area because the resident seed, that seed can stay in the soil about 10, 15 years. So once you've got an established stand, you have to be diligent and you have to be willing to commit to it. If you're mowing it, you've got to mow it more than one time because it's just going to keep on producing seed, right? So um, <coughs> mowing can work and it's going to take a lot of time, but I like the combination of spring herbicide, 2,4-D and dicamba, and followed by aggressive mowing. And eventually you'll get rid of it. All right, thanks. Your next two pictures are a viewer in Omaha 
who uh, moved into her house and discovered all these ferns, which she has been trying to get rid of. Um, she's tried all sorts of things, digging them up, spraying them. How do you get rid of ferns? So a little bit about the biology of ferns, and this is more up uh, your alley, um, Lauren, but you know, they, they spread by spores. Mm -hmm. And so every time you move them, you probably eradicate whatever that's, you know, the big clump that you're pulling out, but then you're continuing to spread, spread the spores off. So you can, if you can cut those off and, and keep them from sporing and keep them cut off, you can, might be able to reduce them some, but they are so aggressive and the, and the, the spore deposition is, is so high. It, you know, there are a lot of products out there that claim to control ferns, um, but once again, it's similar to what we just talked about with the purple hemlock. It seems these two are together for a reason. You have to be aggressive. You have to spray them every time you see green, and you might be able to eradicate them with glyphosate or some of the, even the Roundup with lawns that has um, a more aggressive broadleaf herbicide, but they're not a typical broadleaf weed, so they just have to be aggressive and make sure that they realize that even after you get rid of all the green tissue, there's a huge spore bank down there ready to propagate and start again. All right, thanks, Rock. Uh, Lauren, your first one here is a viewer from Frontier County. You have two pictures. Um, she wonders if this hosta infested with, is infested with the HVZ virus, or is it just one with puckered leaves? Uh, that hostas are always uh, interesting because a lot of people mm -hmm. think they may have viruses. Uh, there's so much variation. From the look of the plant, I would suspect it's not virus infected uh, with that. So I think it's okay, but yeah. it, it is challenging that you can have some of the same rugosity, that roughness and blistering in the leaf with a cultivar that would be a virus in another one. All right, thanks, Lauren. Uh, this is a West Point viewer who has cucumbers with what she's calling rust spots. Mm -hmm. uh, some curling, she has treated with a fungicide. She did lose her entire crop last year. They used chicken manure. Uh, and, and this is a little difficult from the picture, but uh, just, just a few things on, on cucumbers. When I see this type of leaf burning, uh, it, it really, in yellowing the way it looks, it, it makes me think more of some sort of a, a root injury or vine. They could be dealing, if they lost the whole crop, with you know, something that <clears throat> would be like bacterial wilt from um, beetles feeding on, the, on vines um, or even a, a fungal wilt if we see the vines uh, shrivel and, and die. Um, I, I don't see in this particular picture what I would recommend a fungicide for. So I, I would want a little more information on that, but be, be careful that we're sure not looking at a root or vine problem as opposed to the leaves. All right, and your final picture here is a strange jello-like substance on the peaches, and you got this so you can simply say this is probably not a rod or a spot, and we'll come back to it next week. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not exactly sure what it is. Uh, all of our stone fruit, or many of our stone fruits skip, have a disease called brown rot, which can result in that gamosis and gummy expression from fruit, from stems, from others. Uh, if it is brown rot, you would see some twig damage many times, uh, and you would also see soft fruits later in the year. So, so that may be one. Uh, also, insect feeding can do that as well. All right, thank you, Lauren. Terry, uh, your first one is a pack of peppers. <laughs> Planted them all the same. Uh, some have grown nicely, but, but some have grown uh, about four inches tall and stopped, and now all the leaves are kind of growing in the last three inches. Any ideas? Um, so I, I wish you would have showed me like a comparison of the two. Um, one, it could be some kind of a root problem, um, could be planted maybe a little bit too deep and it's starting to kind of uh, a root from that stem or um, depending on where you got it from, oftentimes in nurseries, some people f move plants around and you don't realize it. So it could be a different pepper altogether, even though you think you have all the same. All right, and then your next two are also pepper. This is California Wonder, planted on Memorial Day. She, they're already flowering and she's worried. It, should she be or is that way cool? Well, um, it's kind of way cool. You know, a plant's main goal is to flower and fruit and reproduce. So that's what this plant is doing. Uh, normally with uh, peppers, what I would do is I would pick off either the small fruit or those flowers that first time around and let that plant really get a good root system and get up and growing and be able to sustain that next um, flush of flowers when it comes through. All right, and you have one more, and he's simply asking us, have we ever seen this? Three English cucumbers have grown together. <laughs> um, so this is not three. I don't think this is just one, and it could be one of two things. 
Um, it could be poor pollination and poor pollination happens when we get super high humidity and that pollen gets sticky and it can't move right. Or it could be what we call fasciation, which is this kind of like cool thing that happens to plants just uh, because, and it kind of just makes this fan shape. There's nothing actually wrong with it. Just clip it off and throw it in the compost and wait for your next flower. All right, thanks, Terry. Well, we had a great time meeting some of you last weekend for Discovery Days at the Garden. Time to hear from Terry about what to expect out at the Backyard Farmer Garden now. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we first want to thank all of you that came out last weekend to visit our gardens during East Campus Discovery Days. We had a great birthday and we saw lots of you and we were happy to meet you. But just remember, you don't have to just come during East Campus Discovery Days. The garden is open all year long, 24-7, 365. So come visit us often and see how our garden changes throughout the season. Right now, we're starting to get our containers up and going. They are ready. We're gonna have to start adding that little dose of fertilizer during these hot, months of the summer and we are out there scouting for all those bugs so we're making sure that we're looking for those squash bug eggs um, all the little critters that are eating our lettuces our beans and those kinds of things so we're out scouting we're deadheading we're fertilizing and we're just doing just that regular management of our garden so stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check right it out. It's time for lightning only in here, not out there. Terry, are you ready? <coughs> yes. All right. Uh, the, the people who lost their tomatoes in particular in the <coughs> hail, can they still replant plants and expect to get tomatoes? Yes. Just hurry and go get them. You may not get what you wanted variety-wise, but you'll have tomatoes. All right. We have a Blair viewer who has a forsythia that has suckered all over the place. They want to know if they can use a root sucker killer on the suckers without killing the main plant. Uh, you can, it depends on which one it is. All right. Um, we have a viewer who bought the orange and yellow pixie type Asiatic lilies in full flower. They want to know if they'll flower again. If... Prob probably not. All right. A viewer in, in Kearney had all their sunflowers snap right off. Will they reshoot and reflower? Uh, they may reshoot a little bit at the bottom, but they probably won't reflower. Okay, we have a viewer up in the DeWitt area who did not get their peaches and their apples um, thinned. Can they still do that and expect the other fruit to develop fully? Uh, they'll probably be a little bit behind. Um, they might get a little bit. But... All right, nice job. Ready, Lauren? <laughs> Ready to poke greens, fried and bacon grease. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a Bertrand viewer who uh, has a fungus on his lawn and is wondering, he's used pro propiconazole and Artavia, and he wonders whether he should water in those fungicides or allow the product to sit on the leaves first. And yes, I know it's turf, but. Uh, it's a challenge depending on what he's trying to manage if it's a foliar disease, those foliar applications are fine. If these are granular products and we're trying to manage summer patch, for example, we need to water it in. All right. Um, are hail damaged plants, trees in particular, more susceptible to diseases? Yes. All right. Is there a disease of turf that actually follows the tracks of the mower? Uh, there's several. Uh, any of our foliar diseases can be tracked. The best example of that would be brown patch. All right, um, this is a Pleasantdale viewer who wonders whether a canker or a disease could cause sort of a twisted, gnarly growth on the twigs of Norway spruce. Sure. <laughs> is there a fungicide treatment right now for turf that looks like melted spots? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can a pruning cut in an otherwise healthy apple cause fire blight? Yes. All right. Now, in our, can we in our expand? Our like, no, if, you cannot. If there's inoculum still... present, so if, if you cut <laughs> and, and have a wound, a, we, we had a clock infection. malfunction. So no, you did not answer six questions. <clears throat> you got like two. Okay. Okay, Rock. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> you ready? Sure. 
Okay, this is a viewer who uh, has creeping bent grass in their bluegrass. How do you eliminate it? Tenacity will take blue, uh, creeping bent grass right out of bluegrass. All right, and this is an eastern Nebraska viewer who is next to a golf course that is converting to bent grass. Is that a good thing or a bad thing to convert and will it creep? Uh, it's not going to creep in there. They may get some seed movement, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. And once again, we've got a great control with Mesa Trione or Tenacity. All right. Uh, this is a Blair viewer who says they're having to mow every four days. And does leaving the clippings on the lawn that often hurt the lawn? It, the clippings are 98% moisture. No. If they're mowing that long, they might want to look at their fertility program and back off a bit. All right. Um, this is a Wood River viewer who wants to know whether it's okay to pull buffalo grass plugs now since it's so hot. Uh, perfect timing because it can handle it. All right. This is a Plainview viewer who wants to know what product will control Virginia creeper and when to use it. Uh, the, any of the ones for um, poison ivy will work really well on Virginia creeper. They're just going to have to be persistent. All right. Nice job. Okay. Last but not least. All right, Kyle, are those bagworm crawlers out and is it time to control the bagworms? Yes, they are out and um, you know now the next next week or two is a good time to control. All right, this is an Odo County viewer who said that they had something like a soldier beetle on their yarrow. Is it possible or is that just a fall insect? Um, yeah, there are some soldier beetles that are active right now, yep. Okay, we have an Omaha viewer who bought a bee house but wonders how to face it and how high to put it. Um, that's a, that's a good question. Probably, I would say, you know, a few feet off the ground. Um, but, you know, there's no, I don't have a, a, a specific answer for that. All right. Uh, we uh, have a viewer who wants to know whether BT on the stems and leaves of her squash will deter the squash vine borers. No, BT will not work. Uh, actually, well, no, it probably won't because um, it's not going to uh, control the adults. So, and once those larvae are inside, I don't think it's going to probably do anything. All right, nice job. You always get hard questions. Who won? Terry. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. you, you outlawed. Um, it's rigged. I outlawed. Yeah, Lauren. you outlawed Lauren's questions. Yeah. I, I think yeah. he answered 19. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Terry. just senior word of advice, Kyle, you can use pass. Yeah. <laughs> Terry, what are the plants of the week? <laughs> so so um, we have three today, and the first one will be, I'll start from the top. This is um, purple prairie clover. So it actually starts flowering from the bottom up. So this is the newer flower. This is the older flower. Um, legs that dry, um, full sun, nice fine texture. Um, the next one is the next purple one, which will be bee balm. So that is native, um, full sun, part shade. It works well in um, rain gardens too, because it can take a little bit of wet for a while. And then the last one is this one right here. So this one is new, um, a new addition to the backyard farmer garden. This is um, Daisy May. It's one of the newer ones. It's going to be short and dense and uh, stop by and check it out as soon as we plant it. All right. Thank you, Terry. Okay. Kyle, uh, your first one here is from a Lincoln viewer. You have two questions. Uh, this is, and actually your next ones are the same thing. What happened to the roses? They've looked like this the last two years. The leaves look sick. They've been fine for eight years. Any idea? And then I think you've got another picture. Um, five different types of roses that are basically all different kinds. They're doing the same things. And this is the first time for this viewer in 20 years. Yeah, <clears throat> these are interesting. This is, this is bad. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, you know, it looks like the, these first couple here um, definitely looks like there is some uh, rose slug soft life feeding. Um, you know, I was able to see some kind of window painting on leaves and, and when it does get really bad we'll see those whole leaves kind of brown and shrivel up and and uh, can drop off so I definitely think there's there's rose slug sawfly issues um, for for those you know if for normal infestation you can just spray them off with the hose um, you can use insecticidal soaps or spinosad will also work um, for a really bad um, outbreak like this, you know, probably want something stronger, um, like a carbaryl, 
um, or a pyrethroid uh, would, would be something you could use for those. Um, but that would be something you want to do, you know, start looking at in May. And you're also going to want to monitor, you know, kind of the rest of the summer for this um, because it depends. On, there's three different species, and one of them, the, the um, spiny uh, rose slug, they have several generations throughout the summer. So if, if that's the one that you have, it, you might see more come back. And so you'll, you know, if these roses are salvageable. I think they might be. Um, you would definitely want to keep an eye on that throughout the rest of the summer. So I'm not sure the other one, maybe there are some environmental things going on too, but. Hard to tell. Yeah. All right, and you have two more pictures and this is actually a Grand Island viewer who uh, saw some of the flowers on the yellow shrub roses look like uh, rust. And I think uh, if we keep moving forward on the pics, there they go. Um, other than Japanese beetles, she's never had any problems with this. What do you think this is? Yeah, I'm not certain on this one, but I, I suspect this could be a thrips issue. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does look like on the leaves there's kind of some old thrips injury. Um, they probably then moved off to the flowers. They do prefer feeding on the, um, the buds and flowers, and they're especially attracted to light color flowers, which, which she has here. So. Um, that's kind of characteristic, the brown striping and spotting. Um, and if they feed on the buds, they can really distort those, those flowers when they come out. So that would be my guess. As far as control, you know, I would say clipping those flowers that, that have that damage. Otherwise, there's not really a lot of treatment uh, options because they, you know, they're so well protected inside those buds. All right. Thank you, Kyle. You have two pictures, Rock. This is from Arlington. And this has been, she calls it a grass, and we know it's not. It's the really fine, fine, thin uh, blades there. And I think our second picture is a little close up. What do we think this is, and it's how do you a, control it? One of the onions, it's an alien species of some kind, and there are a lot of uh, products out there. Uh, check the labels, because most of them are combination products, and you need that synergy of the herbicide. So I'm not going to give you a recommendation other than to say to make sure that uh, wild onion or onion is on the label. All right, and you have two pictures of this uh, from this viewer also, and yes, it's in a farm field, but it goes other places as well. What is this? Uh, he, and he's, he's on a farm northwest of uh, Prague. This is scouring rush, and they believe that, especially in cultivated ground, the, the lack of cultivation, since we've gone to you know minimal tillage sort of things, has resulted in an increase. Um, that said, these are very tenacious plants. They've been on the planet for over 300 million years. Um, so they're kind of the <laughs> prehistoric, living fossils as they're called. Um, anything, you know, if you've got a product like Hella Sulfuron, and there is an ag label for that, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is, but that's sedge hammer and turf, and then any triclopyra, generic triclopyra will work pretty good on that. All right, excellent. All right, um, Lauren, your first two here are uh, the first time we've seen this in Nine Bark. This is an Omaha viewer. There it is from a distance, and here it is close up. What is it and what to do? And uh, this is powdery mildew, and uh, it's interesting that it's just on the new growth, and I was trying to read more about why. One of the management recommendations is, is to actually do some thinning and cutting out some of the mature branches mm -hmm. and to do that regeneration pruning on them. And I've not looked, but it may be that these are just on the older branches because powdery mildew tends to be favored by stress. All right, uh, your next <clears throat> one is um, spots on the underside of fine line buckthorn. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this one's interesting, this is a rust <clears throat> and this rust is an alternate host to where it would go over um, to oats, wild oats, several other native grasses uh, with that. All right, um, this is a Scott's Bluff viewer and they're not sure what the plant is. They think it's fungal. What do that's, you think this is? That's very similar to the previous picture. That is a beautiful picture of rust. <laughs> with that alternate host. And again, they're all something. cycling, right? They, they oh, go to yeah. something else, so just like the buck buckthorn goes over to the oat, similar to that one's going somewhere. Right. Sure. Terry, uh, you have two questions here, um, and this is uh, a hosta. She's got an arrow showing the one she's concerned about, and she's, she's done some things like fertilize it and sprinkled seven on it, but she doesn't know why it's not growing. Well, um, my guess is that there's some kind of environmental thing, um, probably maybe some root issues. Um, I usually don't recommend putting anything on something if you don't actually know what's happening. 
Um, fertilizers, especially if you kind of have some slow growth, that kind of will actually spur some diseases and stuff too. Um, so I also looked at it because there are two different hostas there because she was comparing the two. This one is not the same one. So, and there are some hostas that only get to be about eight inches tall, like mouse ears. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know for sure, it may actually only be that tall ever. All right, your next picture comes to us from Omaha. It's a hibiscus that is yellowing in the pot. So hibiscus have lots of issues. Um, <laughs> let's, where do we start? Um, uh, big changes in temperature and humidity will make the leaves turn yellow. Poor nutrition will make the leaves turn yellow. Um, letting it dry out and watering it too much, too, you know, letting it dry out really dry and then watering and back and forth. Um, and then if you had this inside and move them outside, that will make it turn yellow. And then hibiscus, her, um, these are aphid magnets. So check to see if they have aphids. Aphids will also make them turn yellow. All right, and your final one here is Utan, and they have Concord grapes, seven years old. Uh, they've started shedding their grapes. What's going on? So uh, fruit or fruit of anything will actually do that to make sure that it will have fruit. So <clears throat> if it has too much, it will actually automatically shed itself. But that also could be a poor pollination issue. Um, and when it was in flower, there's a rose Schaefer insect that actually likes those flowers and it will actually do something like that. So it could be one of three things. All right, thanks, Terry. You know, it can be somewhat difficult to grow things that do well here in the eastern part of the state out west. So Amy Seiler from the city of Gehring is going to show us some fantastic examples of hardy and beautiful plants that really love the west. We are out here in wonderful western Nebraska and we are at the trial gardens for the city of Gearing um, right up next to the base of Scotts Bluff National Monument and close to Monument Shadows Golf Course. Today we're going to talk about some of the woody plants that do really well in a high and dry environment with limited care. So join me for a fun time of learning some western Nebraska plants. To the left of me right here, this is gamble oak. This is a shrubby type oak that you can use in landscapes that use limited water. It has multi-stems and sometimes it will sucker, so you might need to train it to mind its manners a little bit. In front of me is um, Rocky Mountain Maple. Um, this tree has been here for about 10 years, so you can tell that it stays to a small shrubby size. Some years it does extremely well, and some years we have to cut it back to the base, but it does give us some nice fall color in the winter. To the left or to the right of me, we have um, Domingo Pine. It's a five needle pine that we are trying out here that seems to do extremely well in this high and dry environment. These pines have, um, have been here for about five years behind me and they're doing extremely well with very limited water. Um, generally just some rainwater and maybe getting watered maybe five to six times a year. Um, and to my far right, we've got some wavy leaf oak and that is another semi um, evergreen shrub that does really well with very limited water and care. For over 20 years, the city of Gearing has had a great relationship with the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. And we've introduced many tree species out here that um, we have trialed that have seemed to do extremely well and we can share with our residents things that they should try. What we have in front of me is one of the species that the statewide arboretum encouraged us to try to push the envelope. This is Amur cork tree. And this tree has been here for about eight years. And what we've learned from this tree is typically it grows really well in eastern Nebraska, but we placed it out here in this really harsh environment in our trial garden with a very limited water. And this tree continues to grow and survive. It may not have the growth rate that we have in eastern Nebraska, but it's still a tree that can continues to do well and we are encouraging our residents to try all this tree out here to see how it will do in some of their home landscapes. In addition to the many cool woody species that we have in our trial garden, we also have a ton of wonderful perennials that we're trialing and showcasing 
for our residents. So one of my favorites is Thelosperma. It is this very fine textured, deep green foliage plant. And starting in July, it starts to put on these tiny yellow flowers and it will bloom until frost. It is a wonderful plant to try on the landscape and it loves to spread and move around. So it will bless your garden all over the place. Um, another beautiful plant that we enjoy every spring is Amsonia, also called Blue Star. It is this one of the first things that flowers in our garden. It has these beautiful soft blue flowers. And then in the fall, one of my favorite things is it has this golden yellow fall color. One of my favorite plants in the garden is actually one of our grasses. It's the Sandhills muley grass, and it is a beautiful warm season grass. When the wind blows in late summer, it flows and dances in the wind. It's one of my favorites that's right along our walkway. And finally, we have the Fremont's clematis. It is a treasure in our garden. They're kind of hard to grow, and we have one right along our pathway, and our residents get to walk along and enjoy it in mid-spring, and it is a stellar plant. As you can see, we've got a lot going on in our garden and we encourage our residents to come out and enjoy and learn all the different things that they can grow in Western Nebraska and to push the envelope a little bit when that opportunity presents itself. You know, conditions out west are drier and certainly windier oftentimes. We do hope you'll try some of what we just saw in your own landscape because we've tried it. Our YouTube channel offers many great features and past shows that you can watch anywhere on your phone, tablet, or your computer. If you've got a question, chances are we've produced a video on it, or if you missed the show on Nebraska Public Media, it's posted the next day on YouTube. So take a few minutes after the show tonight, check out the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. All right, we are going to fly through these, Kyle. Your first one is, oh, the announcement. We have a fabulous announcement. Title IX, 50 years in the making, Saturday at 6 p.m. The doors open at 5.30. It's a live taping and it's at the Coliseum on city campus. We have all that on the screen for you. That'll be just awesome. Okay, now Kyle, we do uh, old duffers from rural Western Odo County. What are the eggs on the romaine lettuce? Eggs are really tough. I can't see much detail. I'm gonna guess it's probably a moth. All right, and then your second one is eggs from Wayne on the bottom side of daylily leaves. Yeah, same thing. They're you know they're pretty small. I'm gonna guess it's a it's some small moth. All right, and your third one is is this anything to worry about? If so, how to treat? Probably not a huge concern. Aphids. Um, I think they're probably golden glow aphids or something related, and you can treat with insecticidal soap. All right, Rock. Uh, your first one here is this particular weed came up under the bird feeder. She wants to know what is it and how to control it. Uh, it's wild lettuce, and you can just pull it up. All right, or eat it, or not. Yeah, you, it's edible. <laughs> okay. Uh, your next one is a Prosser, Nebraska viewer. She has tried pulling, spraying, and burning, and it comes back and it brings its relatives and its friends. Hasn't seen it in the turf, but it's along the edges of the grass. So <laughs> what is this? Uh, this is a pineapple weed or wild chamomile, and, and it's got a smell like pineapples when you crush it. You just can't let it go to seed because it's a prolific seeder. So I get it mowed off, or um, you can spray it with any of the broadleaf herbicides that are out there, and it looks like that's an area that it would be safe in. Okay, all right, and your third one is, is this a weed or is this a flower of some sort? She calls this one strong and very determined. Uh, this is a weed because it has weed in the name. This is Virginia stickweed. Um, it has a really inconspicuous white flower on it, which turns into this really nasty burr. It tends to be in woodlands and shaded areas, and if you walk through that area on a little summer walk or whatever, you're gonna come out just covered with these burrs. So um, either they wanna control it or keep, keep it edged back from the walking path. All right, excellent. You have shrooms. Lauren, your first one here uh, comes to us from Hershey, Nebraska. Well, and someone was asking if this is edible. The first thing I want to say to our viewers is to not try to eat any of the wild mushrooms that you would collect unless you're absolutely sure. This one does look much like an agaricus, uh, which is like what you see in the grocery. But again, I would not recommend eating it. Uh, pictures can be deceiving on my side. All right, this is a Lincoln viewer. What kind are these and are they good to eat? Uh, these are in the same group of fungi as our inky cap mushrooms. Uh, it's a different genus, uh, but I'm not gonna comment on edibility, but a beautiful little mushroom. All right, third one here is growing in the mulch in Lincoln. These uh, are stinkhorn fungi. There's a, many different types uh, and you can take and 
touch that sticky stuff and smell it, and it will smell really bad, usually a carrion scent. All right, and your final one, edible or not? Um, this is Fordyce, Nebraska. And, and this one I'm not certain of, actually, so I, I'm going to say not edible. <laughs>